What's up, folks? This is episode 64 with Dr. Kelly Starrett, which is a very good episode. Um, this man is an incredible wealth of knowledge when it comes to really, you know, joint health, physical mobility, all things related to health, to be quite frank, right, quite honest with you. Um, but, you know, check out the Ready State. Um, if you shoot in pain, if you have mobility issues check out his content because i guarantee you it'll help you so with that being said a couple of things i tell you all every episode just about every episode there's a fee for listening to the show the fee is to share the show if you've laughed if you thought something was funny think it'll help somebody share the show number one number two if you want to take it a step further join our patreon subscribers group Maybe commit to um, subscribing and helping to support the Barebow Project and Barebow in general because every little bit helps. And that Patreon page is something that helps us get to the tournaments, cover stuff. You know, not hey, everything costs money these days, and it's just one small way that you can support Barebow in a, in, in a very minimal fashion um, and help us continue to provide coverage and information, coaching help tuning help, tournament coverage, tournament reviews, and everything else that goes along with it. So check that out. Thank you so much for everything. Enjoy the show. I think then um, anybody I can put a name to to promote our sport. The archer who owns all the world records, John Demmer III. You know, the more difficult a thing is, the more important the mental game becomes. I, I didn't eat any supper yet either. How about you either. guys? Did you guys eat yet? I didn't eat Oh, that. you know, uh, I got some crunch berries. Oh, oh yeah. Um. Grayson Parlo. It's like me taking three or four years off your eyes just because I weakened that prescription in the shooting eye. And don't put everything into my shot that I should. That I get a lot of drop on those heavy arrows. It's dropping all the way down. He said, well, you might want to think about going to a lighter arrow in the spring water. And then that's what got that started. So. Yeah. Ding. Yeah. Look, we're, we're rolling. Good to see you, man. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you in this format. I am uh, a huge follower. I don't, I, I don't want to, I know I don't have you for an hour, so I don't want to like, you know, get into all the history but i came across your mobility wad about seven years ago oh man Maybe you'll never more. get that time back i ruined your life you could have been practicing or making content instead i sucked you down some rabbit hole well you're not really i mean i was heavy in the crossfit at the time and olympic weightlifting coaching crossfit like four or five days a week and stuff like that and i gave all that up to coach archery and but a lot of what i learned believe it or not through crossfit through programming through working with athletes working through mobility to to Learning, learning through the process, like literally I was a 30 something year old dude trying to recreate my youth and put, hold barbells above my head. And it wasn't <laughs> until like, I realized, you know, I wasn't anything fantastic. I think my max snatch was like 105 kilos. Like it was nothing crazy, but I, I never understood where mobility and strength in those positions, how it affects everything else. And I've brought that over to, to archery. It is the same. Yeah. Like, it's got it. Once, once you understand one thing, you understand all things. And, you know, I hope you're already recording. No, I'm definitely recording. And this, this conversation will probably end up in the, the edited version for YouTube. But like, so we shoot barebow archery, specifically my, I've, my niche has been competitive barebow. I have to date, um, I'm a coach with a shitty podcast. That's what I am. I'm a good coach <laughs> with a shitty ass podcast. Um, because no, I don't, no, no. I do, I stalked you, you know, I, oh. I am, I shoot. And um, I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, I have a Matthews no cam, which is okay. like, which I, it's like techno weed, like it, I don't even know. It's it is 
like digital porn and then i go back to my longbows and i'm like oh do you so you shoot longbow a little bit of trad i do i have a longbow some trad and i have even an old bear recurve no way i got off of ebay and um (laughs) i think to myself wow i'm gonna starve my family's gonna starve (laughs) and it's so it's so hard and uh you know, I always bounce back and forth. And, and I, I really, today I was like, oh, look at these tabs with these, these, these marks on them. Yes. Yost like, tabs. Is, the Yoast is going to change my yeah. life because I'm like, am I, a, am I a string walker? Am I a fixed gap shooter? Yeah. Like, you know, oh, I, that's crazy. I had no idea that you did any archery whatsoever prior to the initial request for the podcast. And is it Margaret? I'm not, yeah. Know, whoever. She was like, yeah, he plays with archery every once in a while. I was like, oh, all right. I didn't know what to what extent, but yeah. So the Barebow project, you know, it Barebow is, is relatively in its infancy stage for competitive archery. Um, but it's, it's the fastest growing class in all of archery. I get it. And it's, um, it's just, it's growing like wildfire. I and John Demmer, who's like my co-host, he's literally the best arch, best barebow archer in the world. In, in my opinion, he is, but, um, I might have to edit that out. Cause I, he's, I bust his balls a lot and I don't want him to, do <laughs> um, but he holds, he holds all of the world records for my class, for the senior class. The guy's just, he's like, he is the Michael Jordan, in my opinion, of barebow for our current generation, without a doubt. Let me just say, you know, I have come out and done shooting with some of the world's best. You know, I've shot with practical shooters. I've gone, you know, uh, on the ranges and shot with a lot of the military. And I find all shooting to be the same. It really is the, mm-hmm. the same thing, the same. But, you know, one of the things I started doing with the handgun was, you know, I would the target is, you know, 10 feet, you know, and trying to hit the same spot at 10 feet away is so difficult. And when I started taking those skills back, I literally was with the, with the bow thinking to myself, man, I, you know, I did it. I went through a, a stint where I was, I put 50, you know, arrows out a day mm-hmm. and famously one time it was raining and I was in my kitchen shooting through my house out the door to our backyard. And my wife's <laughs> like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, it's raining. I don't want to shoot out. You know, I don't want to stay in the rain. Fair I got to get my 50 in, you know? So um, well, I, now there's this spring protection, string armor. I like this blown my mind. I, I understand the whole, the whole truth of it. So, but the idea is it's such, you know, every time you shoot, a, you know, like a, you know, bullet out of nine millimeter, that's a quarter. You just threw a quarter down the range. Yeah, oh, and I'm like, yeah, 100%. <laughs> and you're just taking like buckets of change and you're just dumping them out and you can shoot and shoot and shoot and practice. And literally the archery makes everything better. And of course, yeah. you know, people have been shooting bows for as long as there've been people, how long have been people doing this? So I'm not surprised that this, this bare bow piece is coming back because it is, I think it's archetypal. I think it mm-hmm. fits into our understanding of how we survived and how we've gotten here. Yeah, well, it fits into our DNA is, is what it comes down to. If you look at it, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, somewhere in all of our ancestry, there we, we have people within our DNA that shot a bow somewhere. Oh, you can go further than that. You can yeah. say that, you know, you and I, as um, if you're a Caucasian in North America, mm-hmm. you, we all have a common ancestor as close mm-hmm. as 500 years ago. And then everyone else, it's not very far. It's 3,000 years ago. Everyone else on the planet. So, I mean, it is much closer than people think about how, how tightly related we all are. And it was, it was yesterday that there was, you know, as you say, that someone in your family was holding the boat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you mind if I get ready to go live here? And, and we'll, we'll just, we're just going to run through it. It goes the Let's direction do it. it goes. I'm, I'm excited. Um, I'm going to go live here in my, in the, in the subscribers group. I'm actually live and I don't normally do this and I may end up regretting it, but I'm live on Instagram at the moment as well, because, um, just because I have no good reason because I wanted to try it. Um, let me, why is this not going live at the moment? Let me take a look here. See if there's a reason. See if, see if Facebook is blocking me. Hold on a second, everyone. How do you want me to, do you want to say doc, Dr. Starrett, Kelly, what's the, what's the preference? Whatever you want, whatever fits into your culture better. doesn't matter. I'm not, I mean, I did, you, 
do you describe yourself through your uh through your you know last educational degree no you don't <laughs> no no i don't <laughs> oh let's try this again and besides you know my wife and i kid that you know i'm not even a physical therapist anymore you know like what am i oh like, yeah you know what is this thing we do i don't know that's funny i just say i was classically trained as a physical therapist classically trained I like the piano oh, that's awesome that's funny all right, looks like we are going live now on Facebook. Hopefully I got that right. I am recording. Yeah, got it. Got it. Click play. All right, looks like we are going live. Yep. Now See, there's that Facebook. back. There we go. I'll take the volume off. All right, so I'm here with Mr. Kelly. I should say Dr. Kelly Starrett. Um, most of the people who follow the Bearable Project, very few are going to know who he is unless you're into probably mobility, joint health, um, geez, CrossFit, extreme fitness stuff, uh, Olympic weightlifting, stuff like that. Um, Kelly, do you mind just, can you just give a brief background of everything, what that is the ready state, your background, what you do, and then we'll kind of just, we'll roll from there. Yeah, here's, here's what I want you to understand. If you have a body, and you use your body let's just say i don't know sometimes people's shoulders hurt when they pull on a bowstring that's i think that's a truism right then you should know how to take care of that identify movement limitations quickly and then take a crack at restoring your movement limitations if you're in pain you should have a strategy to get out of pain which can be restoring your range of motion, but it also can be, you know, some, something has gone on in your life or your brain has suddenly become interested in what's going on, is perceiving what you're doing as a threat. So you should have a set of tools to be able to manage that besides bourbon, right? And Oxycontin and, you know, and THC or whatever else you're using to self-soothe. Sure. And then simultaneously, we recognize that when athletes begin to understand that they can actually do more work and handle more volume, if they work on recovery and adaptation, then you can do, get more work done and delay soreness. And in a big tournament that goes on three or four days or any other situation, you know, it always comes back to the same rule. Whoever can do the most work wins. So, you know, if you and I go out to the range, we're, we're speaking bow here and you put down 300 arrows and I only can put down 200 arrows because my shoulder starts to hurt or I start to lose positioning or my mechanics, my posture, my organization, my body is inefficient and I can hold it for a while, but I can't hold it after a while because I just don't have the sort of the tensegrity to be able to put that whole body together to hold that big bow. You're going to get more and more and more practice. Then if you can go home and take care of yourself, you're not going to look like a beat up archer at the end of the day. Yep. You're going to show up the next day ready to go again. And that volume gap in terms of practice starts to, you know, take a quantum leap away from each other. So what we're trying to do at the ready state is help people manage their pain because that's real. And that's going to happen because you're just mm -hmm. a, a human being. Pain is not damage. Pain is uh, not trauma. Pain is a request for change simultaneously, you know, can are you capable of actually doing what your body is supposed to be able to do because it turns out there are the archery positions or any shape is actually predicated on the structure of the human body on the physiology of the human body correct and if, and if you have access to those positions then you get to do the same thing every single time and if we can start to reduce that movement variability in your body then you start, the only mistake you make is, oh, your breath was off or your concentration was off or you didn't aim in the right place. But it would be nice if we could get you to address the club, the barbell, the every draw is the same every single time because there's going to be enough variability in the rest of the sport. How do we minimize that variability? Let's just at least start with a, a baseline. So we don't, uh, you know, we don't have to sort of be as inefficient. And you know, Juliet and I feel strongly that you're going to be 100 years old, whether you like it or not. So what's your plan for the back half of your life? You're going to stop shooting when you're 50? You stop shooting when you're 60? No, and I think and a, a key component to why I asked you to come on the podcast is that archery is a life sport. And, and more than probably more than most other sports, we have an older senior, senior as in 65 plus population 
of archers still shooting, still competing. I was just this weekend was competing at the National Field Archery Association um, National Championships. I mean, we're talking guys in their 60s, 70s, 80s walking around four or five days, 28 targets through the through the hills, shooting shooting archery. So, I mean, like they take their time. And I guess that's that's one of the big reasons. Now, this past winter, I went through a significant amount of pain issues. And and we can maybe this conversation might completely be derailed already. What we're <laughs> going to talk about, but whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I had my suspicions as to why. Maybe that's something that we, we can bring up today or maybe we talk about sidebar. Um, but I've always as a coach and as the, the further I've I've dove into Barebow and specifically target panic. Are you familiar with target panic as far as archery? I am a firm believer that excessive, and I call it negative tension for back, lack of a better term, negative tension at the full drop position is the is one of the key components that opens the door to target panic. And when I say that, I say that in like if you're not using the biomechanical most advantage advantageous position of at full draw you are opening the door well Shoot. how about this iangar yogi master says the nerves are king of the breath the breath is king of the brain so if you're struggling to hold a position and at full draw and you can't take a full breath there if you can't hang out there and it's muscular based not mm -hmm. systems based yes. bony based yes. fascial based muscle based but you know think about that japanese classic archery draw just hold that pull that bow across your chest and don't actually finish the idea and just let me know how effective you are going to be and the kind of tension you're going to create to solve that problem and i think you're absolutely right is that we can give people back their their biomotor efficiency and it's going to look a little different person to person but the pro, the principles are the same then we start to reduce error we reduce variability mm -hmm. you know one of the reasons archery is so amazing is that we're like here's this complex motor skill and by the way there's 10,000 variables you're not even aware of going on as you're trying to hit this target right all all there's so many things happening so we're taking people off the street and we're like, here's a complex motor skill and good luck trying to make your body. And if you don't have a coach early on, you'll solve that problem. You'll work it out. And oftentimes the solutions that people are coming up with, with any sport, end up being very dead end solutions. I don't know. So you get a coach, suddenly you're like, what do you mean? I'm holding it wrong. I, what? This is how I've always shot. I've already got 15,000 arrows in this, this technique. Yeah. So the, the key is that once you understand this, then you, and you understand sort of what the key principles of the shoulder are, how the, how the body works, you suddenly can see anyone's coaching. And what you're seeing is different tactics for the same biomechanics, a different language for the same biomechanics. And sometimes you'll see a, one super coach, you know, talking about present company, and they have a, a really universal language that allows everyone to understand what's going on. But this is why you can have world champions from so many different disciplines of shooting yeah but everyone's shooting looks the same at the end right right yeah 100 percent agree i guess that there's a lot of people that put this big huge emphasis on mental training mental training mental training mental training and i'm like okay i was like i get it super important especially at the highest levels of competition but i feel like in in many ways it's it's putting the cart before the horse and again this is why you're here to, to really kind of maybe unhinge like the joint, the, the importance, you've already touched upon a lot of it, but like taking care of your joints, fixing pain issues, um, how to or where to refer to to fix mobility issues. Archers are notorious for shoulder issues, notorious. I mean, you see people, it, it's, it's cringeworthy for me as a coach, but I see people who draw their compounds and they're up and they're like, I'm one of these <laughs> to try it again. And those, those, those the, the what are they the lacrimal sacs in the shoulder are aren't aren't operating because they're doing this instead of the natural rotation of the shoulder and they're doing all these things and i'm just like and i try to explain they're like oh well, i do it so that the deer doesn't see me draw my bow back i'm like okay well you're destroying your shoulder one pull at a time so go ahead keep doing that but it's it's one of those things and the target panic discussion may come up may, we may end up doing another one of these or something or talking whatever but like I try to explain to people in regards to like addressing the target panic issue, 
you if you aren't looking at the whole capacity of of what you are doing to to um to fix target panic you're really just kicking the can down the road of the problem coming back um and but people are like oh it's not you know every form doesn't matter we all shoot whatever we want to shoot and um as long as we do it the same every time we're good like you that very well may be the case for three months six months a year maybe longer sooner or later it's gonna bite you in the ass sooner or later you're gonna have a hard time adjusting your skill up or skill down i think that's really where when we're talking about training we're always keeping an eye on what we call transferability are we making movement choices because that's what we want we want choice but a lot of times when you hear someone say this is the way i shoot and it's the best way you need to just overlay this filter it's the only way that person can shoot it's how they've solved their problem based on they have no rotation in the shoulder they can't turn their neck they don't you know they're they're rounded in the sh- front of their shoulders and the t-spine is stiff um they don't know how to root into the ground and create a stable platform to stand on yes. so all of a sudden what you end up seeing is you know and we see this in across a lot of sports and and remember we have a minute to get it right it's not like you take that 10 arrows and then your shoulders are gone and the most right. important thing you can start to do is to start shooting right away i mean we want you to get shooting but what we should be thinking of is, and if we're taking this big metaphysical view, we're getting to, we're shooting because it's a way of understanding ourselves. How rested am I? How prepared was I? You don't walk up to the golf, you know, I don't remember who said it, but it's like, you don't walk up to the first hole in a tournament and be like, today I'm going to be great. That greatness starts a lot of steps back. One of the things that we see across all sports and especially recreational sports, which are, you can do kind of cold and you can drink a lot of beer the night before and go shoot the next day. (laughs) Yeah. Not shoot necessarily good, but you can say, I didn't say that. Right. That's why we have all these fancy uh, lasers and, you know, it's, it's much easier to do it this way. Um, But one of the things we should be thinking about even from the first is who, whose body do I have today? Because I'm not a perfect person. I had to sit at a computer and I had to drive at my daughter's tournament this weekend and I'm a little bit sore and I injured my shoulder in judo in college and whatever the background is, you know, I ask people all the time, well, can you talk to me about how you prep your body before you go do your sport? And they're like, well, I take the bow out of the car and I string it and then I shoot. And you're like, oh, okay. So what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. You know, can you show me your shoulder prep? Do you, and if you're embarrassed to do that at the range, why aren't you doing it at home? So suddenly what we realize is we don't really have good ways. And in, in some of these sports that feel historic, historical, um, we inherit a weird sort of set of principles and behaviors because that's the way it was always done. And this is uh-huh. the way my great grandfather shot and, you know, and, and what we see is, well, you know, that's not keeping up with how we come to think about the body and the mind and the prep for every other sport and every other task on the planet. And so suddenly when we start to bring in those principles, I'm like, hey, did you drink any water today before we're on the range? Because your tissues are going to be pretty friable and janky and you haven't had any water and salt. You drank a pot of coffee and, you know, so there are a, a certain first principles that underlie the human physiology And what we're trying to do then is say, hey, look, in this situation, you're going to have the best brain, the most focus. If you're shooting wrong, put some salt under your tongue and drink some water. And then let me show you what happens to your brain. You're going to be like, oh, my God. There's so much truth to that. I literally went through that this past week. (laughs) Of course you did. And God forbid you ever shoot somewhere where it's hot in the summer. And so suddenly what you're realizing is, okay, I have a set of behaviors that prepares my brain for this very intense focus. Right. And that's that's what this is. This is literally a walking meditation. So are you prepared to have your body get out of the way of your brain? Secondarily, are you prepared to have tissues that are tolerant and resilient to handle your crappy setup and your weird draw underneath the bush? And like it's not it's not perfect. I mean, that's one of the reasons that this barebow is so cool. You walk around and you have to take shots in weird positions and duck under trees. And it's not like I'm at this same archery range at the same distance with the same covering and I have the same hat on. And then that's not real. 
Yeah, so we do, do we have get... well in some in some regard. Not to interrupt, we do have field archery. We have target archery. Oh, we do that where we're standing on an Olympic competition field. You're shooting the same distance. You're shooting the then exact same then format. It's, then it's but simpler. It's ultimate accuracy, though. We're we're trying to essentially hold a group the size of a softball at 55 yards with no sights. And then, and then you get into, you get well, you into just, what you just told me was magic and science. I don't even, like, I don't believe that's not even possible. I don't even know what you're talking about. hundred percent possible, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's that like the concept before we started recording, we were talking about like, you know, muscular issues and, and, and how, how like extra tension, poor mobility injury. I shot with what I believe was um, tennis elbow. And I was getting pain. I actually ended up getting it worked out by um, a massage therapist and my uh, grats and with my chiropractor. My lat was as hard as a rock. Weird. Hard as a rock. So when no. I turn on your on your right arm, no. On my draw arm. On my no, draw course. arm. And you know, I can honestly say, in all of my archery experience, I've never addressed anything muscular in my back at all. And I was dealing with this like pulling pain that was happening at my lat, my rib and into my rhomboid. And it was, it would happen when I would try to keep my hips over my heels and then coil with my upper body. And it, it like, it just created so much extra tension. My lat over time just hardened completely. And it was a nightmare to shoot. Um, probably a lack of maintenance i also think it had something to do with the style that i was shooting at the time because the concept of tightening your tucking your hips and tightening that lower core or that lower area automatically is going to bleed tightness into my lower back and then have to turn it just it seemed like it was a, a mix for a disaster for me personally but um and it's just this this idea of like shooting with pain you shouldn't do um, if you have pain, fix it. If you don't know how to fix it, hey, everyone, there's a reason I'm doing this podcast. It's this guy. Um, well, let's ready- just say if you have pain, that's like, it's in, let's treat it as information. Hey, my body is giving me a feedback and I need to take that feedback. If suddenly your grouping is off or you're doing something weird, we would just treat that as another piece of data. So let's treat that information about the body as part of the bow arrow system. Right? right. The problem is we're not thinking about it in those terms. The first part, the first, the the primary weapon system of the of the any human, you know, tactical shooting anything is the body first. Sure. So the issue is, you know, can you imagine not doing any maintenance on your gear ever? Well, that's what you're doing to your body. So you know, and and you're going to get away with it for a long time. The issue is you can wait around till something hurts, which is totally a reasonable thing to do because you're a working, busy person. And then when something pops up, you can say, huh, I wonder what that's telling me. Oh, what's going on? How am I going to un- interpret what this is around this pain piece? Or I can run a simultaneous diagnostic process where, hey, if I have a, something like Pilates or yoga or a classic strength and conditioning system, I'm going to understand that I can put my arms over my head or I have incomplete shoulder mechanics. Something is going to show up because I'm running this parallel test all the time. Mm-hmm. And then simultaneously, you could just you know, say, hey, I know that my lats are involved and my shoulders involved and my forearms are involved. And I could just do some maintenance on that and play a little bit of press and guess as a, as a start in. And, you know, if you're having pain here and you get on a roller and you can't take a breath and it hurts, then you found you found part of the inefficiency in the system. Yeah. And and what we haven't done, again, it's crucial to keep in mind is that it's no one's fault. What we're trying to do is say, hey, look, this was our best understanding 20 years ago. But welcome to the modern age of being an athlete and a lifelong shooter. And this is what the best practices look like. And yeah, you're going to have, we're going to ask a little bit more of you. Are you prepared to shoot today? So if I had young, once kids are in the program where I have athletes in my program, you know, they show up for a lesson or show up for, and I'm like, are you prepared? Is your body prepared? Is your brain prepared for this learning today? You haven't had breakfast, man, you're going to shoot like crap, you know? So, uh, you know, let's see what's going on. So again, let's just take the same principles underlying here 
and let's take the body and let's make sure we can do the things we should be able to do. We have tissues that can handle it. Then we can argue about whose hard style, Kung Fu style is the best and who's the best archer, not who's the best at going around the problems. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great way to put it. So story time this past week, we shot the NFAA. It's, I only shot Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday was practice, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, I did not shoot, but you actually, there's three different rounds, two of the rounds you get to shoot a second time. So I never shot field and this is a, a um, target face, 80 yards to 10 yards. 80 and yards. yeah, 80 yards to 10 yards, 28, tar- 28 target, wait, 14. Yeah. 28 targets per course for four days. Okay. It was a hundred and 100, 101 degrees Tuesday. It got progressively warmer as, as the, maybe in the 90s somewhere, whatever heat index, I don't know, here in Pennsylvania. And it got progressively warmer until Saturday. It cooled off a little bit, but still in the 90s. Tuesday, my son and I went with John. John, when it comes to this stuff, is without a doubt my mentor. He shot field. I haven't shot field since I was like a teenager. Um, and I never shot it shooting barebow. I shoot everything else, shoot everything else well. Um, Shot Tuesday out in heat, practice, went, you know what I didn't do? I had the whiskey you mentioned that night and did not water up. Wednesday came, I woke up with a headache. Didn't even, I thought, ah, oh, allergies. I didn't think anything of it. Had my coffee, no, no, number two. Um, maybe had a bottle of water somewhere along the way and was drinking water most of the day. Headache wouldn't go away. What do I normally do when um, I have a headache? It's usually water, salt, caffeine. It's usually one of those three. Well, I did them all, nothing, and nothing, not, nothing was helping. And John, John was like, he was kind of hounding me. He's like, dude, you drink any, you drink water, you got to drink electrolytes. Okay. All right. Well, I had a Gatorade track. So I was playing catch up from the first day of the tournament. Literally about, I'm going to say two thirds of the way through the first round. Uh, I think it happened the second day also my the tip of the arrow was blurry and it's never blurry for me and i remember saying like why is this blurry i'm so i'm like moving i wear a tape because um my left eye shooting with both eyes open i see two arrows that sit like this so i use scotch tape to just blank out the left eye and it clears up the arrow for me i started out it was clear got two thirds of the way through and everything went went blurry it's dehydration i mean it's classic dehydration and john john was like talking to me the next day. He was like, dude, you've got to drink. You got to drink more. He's like, and you got to, you have to replace the electrolytes. The water's only going to get you so far. And two days of on and off, most like headaches, the blurred vision happened twice, got lightheaded on, on date on Thursday. And to think about all of the, that maintenance side of being a competitor that I didn't do, and then try to shoot the best of your game. It's nearly impossible to do. And think about all of the practice gone into that, the time, the travel. And we just, we just make a simple error. And again, yeah. I think it's a really cool thing to be able to do, to be able to have some whiskey with your friends when we all get together. The key is we just haven't also said, by the way, you know, I know that you only shoot in an air-conditioned you know, garage. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, but it turns out that there's, you know, when we take people outside or into these other stressful environments, if we haven't prepared people, you know, for example, we think that people probably need between three and five grams of salt. And you, I can only see your upper body, but you're an adult-sized man, probably uh, yeah. over 200 pounds. I'm a pounds. big boy. I'm 6'3", 250 pounds. I, yeah. I mean, you're not, yeah. So, so, you know, at some, at some point, what you realize, you're like, oh, I'm behind. And now we've added another layer of this physiology here, mm-hmm. which is, you know, you're going to have to be even more exceptional. So what we want people to think about is you don't have to be perfect. There's so much tolerance in the system. But when we start to control for variables, we start to simplify best practices. Then it's not like, well, I have to have this breakfast to shoot great. It's that I've done these things to control what I can control. And then I can go out and do what I need to do. And, and that really ends up being the same recipe I use in the Olympics, world championships, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what we're always trying to do, again, I really appreciate that you're saying that there's so many masters here shooting because we can back off, draw weight. You can jump into a different, you can shoot shorter courses, but there's no reason. Show me a reason 
why humans stopped hunting. Can you please do that? So I start with that assumption, not that like this is some romantic, I have some random notion of archery, sure. but when you stop being able to shoot a bow, you probably got real hungry real fast. Oh, and yeah. um, so it's one of those things I'm like, we've, we're designed to walk our whole lives. We're designed to do some of these fundamental things. Maybe you're not, you know, you're not going to be the at lateral world champion when you're 80, but uh, I guarantee you your skill when you're 80 is so good that you, no one, none of the young kids can beat you because they have, you have, you know, an order, two orders of magnitude, more, more arrows than range. So let's say, what are the best practices for this? For example, if I was really interested in coming into your program, first thing I would do is make everyone track their sleep. And guess what? I would see all kinds of wild variability. And if I'm trying to treat shooting like any complex learning schema, well, suddenly I can say, well, if you're not getting eight hours of sleep, it's going to be really difficult to improve. You're not going to integrate those skills. And that means you need to be in bed for nine hours or eight and a half hours so that we can, you know, we can get that. If you've got seven hours of sleep, that's our minimum threshold for viability. You get seven hours of sleep the night before competition because you're stressed. That's not going to, you're going to shoot fine the next day. But on day three or day four, it starts to really pay. And your and dividend. So if we're starting to kind of come in, as you're saying, what are the first principles here? You know, I'm like, hey, you know, let's, if I gave you my child's bow and just said, hey, here's, you know, 20 pounds, mm-hmm. pull that. I'm like, show me you can actually take a breath in that position. Mm-hmm. And guess what? You're not going to be able to breathe under tension. Your mechanical ventilation is off. So now you're taking a different breath every single time. There's just a lot to work on. That's super yeah. cool. That's why this is so intellectually interesting because I can, I can only get better and better and better and better. And, you know, you know, what do they say? If you want to be really good at painting bamboos, you know, that old story, you know, paint bamboos every day, become bamboo, be obsessed bamboos, and then forget about bamboo when you paint. (laughs) You can shoot archery every single day, but if you don't do the right stuff, you don't have the right paint, it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. Um, I explain, and I, that's probably one of my biggest philosophies with, um, with, with archery is I, I advocate for a lot of shooting drills and stuff like that practice being in that right position, being in that, that position and feeling strong in the way you want your aim to be and all that stuff. And all of that's a crossover from like, what, well, what do I want to do to be better in the overhead position and the snatch? Well, I'm going to do overhead squats. What am I going to do? If I can't lock out in that overhead position, well, I'm going to work on the mobility in my neck and my shoulders and being stronger in that position. Exact same philosophy I apply to archery um, and the shooters that I work with. And, and that's, that's because it, it truly worked in that you're under tension, holding a barbell, whatever position you're in. If you need to get better at being under tension, that's, you have to work on the things that allow that to happen. Uh, movement patterns and and joint health and all that other stuff having a a simple little doohickey like this stretch band right here not only can you practice your shot but you can do pass throughs and you can do all of these things open close the gate and you know whatever else you choose to do prior to a tournament to warm up the shoulder capsule do that stuff and that's one of the things i wanted to talk to you about is you know, it's kind of hard on, on zoom and, and, and in a podcast was like, Hey, well, what should people be doing? But like, if you had to go and dive in, I'm going to segue right out into another topic here in, in, in some way. So, but like in your, in your opinion, like what are some things that archers should be armed with and working with before, and maybe even after every practice session, um, when, when you, if you search my name, Kelly Starrett, S-T-A-R-R-E-T-T, I have something called the shoulder spin up. And I want you to start doing the shoulder spin up before you shoot. And that can be done in the morning. That can be done at home before you get in the car. It can be done at the range. Only takes a couple minutes, but we're going to prep, prepare the rotator cuff and the shoulder. We're going to touch positions and shapes that you're going to need to be in. And we're going to tie that whole arm into your head, into your vestibular system, into your eyes. 
and into your thoracic spine. So suddenly you're going to have this system. We're going to get nerves to run through nerve tunnels a little bit better. And it's super simple. I teach it to 12 year olds. If my 12 year old volleyball team can do it and my swimmers can do it. I guarantee you can do it. It's, it's part of our, our shoulder prep all the time. And it's really super simple. Don't need any equipment. Right. I'm gonna have to, I got to find this. Hold the on. shoulder spin up. Shoulder spin up. Yeah. Second thing we have is called um, the, I call it the, my, like, if you go to our blog at the readystate.com, I have this thing called my morning routine. And you can see our hip prep or hip spin up. And it's some ground based exercises to restore rotation and to open up your hip and to connect your hips to your back. Again, super simple. You're going to be like, oh, this is like modern sun salutation yoga. Mm. And what you'll finally see is that it doesn't, it's really simple to jump into these things. They're restorative in and of themselves, but you'll be better prepared. And what you'll see is that when you go on the range, take your first draw, you're going to be like, wow, that was easy. That's mm. better. Mm. And my efficiency. And what we want to start to do is just be thinking, hey, what are, th what are the behaviors that I can stick with that I can integrate into my life as a busy person who's already creating time to shoot every day, which is miraculous. Mm -hmm. So how am I going to honor that the most important thing you can be doing at the range is drills and shooting and volume of shooting and practice. So how can I prepare you and work this into the rest of your life so that when you show up, it's really time to go. And that's no different than the way we talk about our athletes stepping onto an NFL field or onto the Olympic tournament match or whatever's going on. How can we prepare you in your, in your life so that when it's time to go, we don't have to mess around. You don't have to do a bunch of stuff to make your body feel good when everyone else, you can just pick up the bow and start going. So those things, what I'd love you to do is when you get home in the evening, away from everything else, spend 10 minutes, 10 minutes is all I'm asking to do some basic soft tissue work. And if you go to the readystate.com, we have a couple things here that are really useful for you. We have an app that will ha is, has a simple mobility test so you can discover if you're missing critical, essential, normal, normative ranges of motion. Hmm. And you don't even have to understand necessarily how they connect. I've done that for you. And then I program to you. Spend 10 minutes restoring one of those things. Or I have 10 minute, 20 minute, and 30 minute follow along daily mobility exercises where you're going to do daily, just if you have a ball and a roller, then I'll teach you how to take care of your rotator cuff and mobilize your lats. Perfect. And if you do five minutes on the left side and five minutes on the right side, you do five minutes tomorrow on the left side, five minutes tomorrow on the right side, it's 10 minutes a day. In a week, you can make massive amounts of change where you can make your shoulders feel better. And pretty soon, what you begin to realize, you're like, oh, I am an archer. That means that archers have a certain set of behaviors and tissue behaviors. So you start to understand your body and you're like, well, when I get home, you know, it's that right lat. So I'm going to need to spend three minutes on my right lat. I don't need to do my left lat. I'm going to go hit the other side because that side is sore in my rotator cuff. So I'm going to go sure. maybe do a little posterior shoulder mobility with a, just a ball laying on the ground. And pretty soon you really start to understand when something pops up or feels stiff in the evening, it's like an after action report. If we did live video feed of every shot you took, and we mm -hmm. did that in the evening, it's the same thing, but for your body, how does my body feel tonight? What, what got tired or fatigued on the range? What was sore after when I jumped in the car I was like, Ooh, I felt that. So now let's go ahead and spend 10 minutes. So if we just did those two things, because we can go deep into the woods on all the things I think are best behaviors. Yeah. But if you did a little shoulder spin up or hip prep, then in the evening did that, man, I'm not asking you to give up your life or, or become some kind of weird monk. You don't need to do that. I'm asking you to be an athlete, right? Yeah. And use those terms because that's what we're doing. And all of a sudden you'll see that you, your brain and body are start, going to start to work better and you'll pick up the bow and know who you are today. And that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to get, my feeling is the athlete who can find herself the fastest during warm up 
and then shoot to her ability, that's the best athlete. And so that's why we warm up and we prep is we're getting to know our bodies and our stress and all the things that happen. And the closer I can shorten that distance between me and getting back into my flow, then it's that mat. It's not like some magic flow and I have to shoot my first arrow and I haven't, you know, and I, my tape was weird and like, it's none of that stuff. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that you refer to the notion of referring to yourself and treating yourself as an athlete, because that is one thing that does not happen enough in archery in general, especially the bear, like bear bows, like the, we're kind of like the redheaded stepchild of the competitive archery world. Like we're very like laissez faire. Yeah. We just love shooting. You know, we miss ha ha it happens. But at the same time, there's an incredible competitive nature to it as well. And, and again, one of the reasons I view archery the way I do is because I've been an athlete in, in some capacity, firefighting included my entire life. And the, one of the, the reasons that you have been one of those like check mark guests on the podcast is because I treated myself that way when I was doing the other, the, the CrossFit and the weightlifting and I, and, and I, for some stupid reason, getting in back into archery on a competitive level, I didn't have that same notion or that same commitment. And then, and then when I started with that commitment again, that's when I realized, oh, wow, I'm not the only one missing the boat here. There's hundreds and maybe thousands of archers out there that are missing the boat too. Um, and, and let's reframe some of the conversations we're having. I want to be clear that I'm not saying you need to do this. So you don't get injured. Sure. I'm saying, I think you're shooting poorly and that you have so much untapped low hanging fruit, untapped potential to shoot to be better, to be better without ever actually having to change your archery. I think that's, what's remarkable. I'm like, no, yeah. no, no, no. You're, you know, you, you're pulling a 400 pound draw on some antique thing with arrows that are children's arrows. That's how dirty it is. You're, on those wobbly things you're doing i'm like you know there's a lot of things that you could just cross off the list yeah which means you have more enjoyment which means you're more successful and theoretically we're doing all of this practice and competitions that when we go out and decide to actually hunt we can be successful and actually carry something back and we have a body that can handle that i mean this is this is the the thing i have so many friends who got into archery with the compound hotness mm -hmm, we'll call sure. it that right cameron, yeah and, cameron haynes joe rogan oh yeah you get all you get you you start seeing those guys shooting you know going to big big animal hunts stuff like that compound blows up you know bear bow is definitely the bear bow trad side of things is definitely way behind in that exposure but at the same time it's 10 times harder not everybody wants to do it I don't know if it's 10 times harder. Maybe it's 20 times harder. Maybe it's so, like I said, I, I, I find it to be so hard. That's really the challenge. It's so interesting. Yeah. Um, we, uh, you know, we'll barbecue and we just set up a target, you know, just next to our barbecue that is like 15 yards or even yeah. 10 yards. Yeah. And then we have like life and death competitions and uh, it's, it's so on. You, know, you get one arrow and then like, you know, you, you don't have a second arrow follow-up. You only get that first arrow, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you start adding the motor learning into this, you know, like delayed knowledge of results, black block practice, random practice, you know, I'm like, oh, you, you just got feedback from that first arrow. So your second and third and fourth and fifth arrow should be great, right? <laughs> you should be getting better and your groups get tighter and tighter, but it's that first arrow that tells me who you are every single time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I'm a big fan of periodization for archery training personally, but I, uh, you know, it's, uh, and that's a that's a thing i know a ton of archers who just show up and shoot you know, hundreds of arrows every day and they're like why am i not getting better <laughs> or why and i'm and i'm just like hey i'm like you're getting better but you know your 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 getting better is like this little tiny notch in your belt and then people who are doing all of the other stuff and worrying about the biomechanics and worrying about the mobility and doing the shooting drills and and probably some exercise in there and, and whatever their, their journey is much faster to getting to their, reaching their highest level of potential. And, you know, I try to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that 95% of archers do not do any 
true practice prep and tournament prep outside of just shooting arrows. I think that that's reasonable. And remember, if you're listening to this, we always ask when we're, we, I'm asked to come in and help untangle a lot of hot messes or help people understand what's going on or find opportunities. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we ask is, well, who was your teacher? Where did they come from? Where did you learn? You just thought you would teach yourself an Olympic sport. Oh, that's cute. How'd that go for you? You know, yeah. like, you know, like all the best coaches in the world, all the best athletes in the world have coaches. And you just thought you'd just pick up this, this tradition, this art, you know, it's crazy. And simultaneously, you know, just shifting this mindset, as you're saying, into what does a practice look like? You know, Zen and the art of archery, archery was like the last thing, the arrow leaving, the, you know, is the last thing on the whole list of being prepared to do that. And, yeah, and um, when you're, you know, just the, the skill and the practice alone, you know, have you ever seen Russians teach kids how to swing a tennis racket? they don't actually hit a ball for like a year. They just draw and swing and prep and slow yeah. motion, you know, and um, I don't think we do the same thing, you know? The, 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 the Asian countries, Korea, Japan, China, their archery programs start when kids are literally um, like pre-K and they start, with a, they start with something like this and all they do, for school for their public school system is they run through the motions and that's all they do that's all they work on as kids they don't even touch bows and then they as they get older so like kids that are nine years old have probably thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of shots done before they even shot a bow the first time and then they get as they get older they get introduced to the equipment and then all of a sudden they're you know and it just it changes the it changes the entire dynamic the way that they teach it over there it's just they're hammering it home and that's why they're not shooting a bow the first years years of preparation and there's no wonder that those countries have continued to be the elite of the elite in the olympics shooting olympic recurve because just their their training regimen and the way they approach it is completely different now it granted actually, it, it actually I, there's a lot of things going on there but it actually looks like sport and I just want to say, not that they have the trappings of, of sponsorship and a, a state supported system. Huge. I just yeah, mean, I just going to say they that. just yeah. treat it very much like any complex skill done at a competitive level. And what we want to ask ourselves is well, how much of this can I take on without becoming a monk? As we said before, right. what can I integrate into my life so that I have more joy? so that I can have a better experience, so that I can go and do the thing I want to do more. And some of those things end up being, there are universal. You know, one of the things you could do every day to become a better archer, wait for it, is walk 10,000 steps. And I would actually say eight to 12,000 steps. Why? Because I need you to decongest your tissues. I need you to wow. circulate the lymphatic through your system. If you're going to show up at a, an archery competition, get up early, give me, and go for a half hour walk. And you'll suddenly realize that you're like, wow, I feel great today versus, man, I'm stiff. I went down to the Best Western and I had an omelet and then I got to the car and then, you know, talked to my friends. You know, there you're going to see that underlying a lot of the best behaviors are foundational principles of physiology that we just control for or manage the best of our abilities. And the same thing then is true suddenly when we look at the drills that our coach is asking you to do. What they're really trying to do is connect your brain to your physiology and to reduce the variability and increase the accuracy. When I say accuracy, I'm not talking about where the arrow goes. I'm talking about what your body does every single time. Yeah, the level of, um, of repeatability of your shot process is, is, is affected by Look, that. Look, you can use your fancy archery terms, repeatability yeah. of your shot process. Well, you know, you're the king of fancy terms. I don't want to hear that. Um, <laughs> I love I've it, watched man. Your, I, I, I watch just... your YouTube channel way too much. I know. I know. Um, no, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, this, so for everyone watching and there's only a, a fan, that's the viewership, it's kind of an awkward time of day for, for live recordings, but it's fine. But, you know, for everyone watching, like you, you, you have to understand, like I've been following this guy for a long time and to be able to put face to face via Zoom and talk about and, and apply, I guess, in some ways, the things, the dribs and drabs of things that I've learned from watching you and applying it to the sport that I am so passionate about 
it really kind of like you're such a you're such an unknown resource that people don't even know about in archery and i want them that that's one of the biggest reasons i want to do this podcast and i want them to know how much knowledge and um opportunity there is for them to get some serious help outside of the box of what normal archers think about oh I, I could probably get some help from this guy or from, from subscribing to, uh, as a minimum, subscribing to the YouTube channel and listening to, you have a podcast, right? Uh, your we own, po- your yeah, own podcast. My wife and I have podcasts. We just talk about health and we try to shine light on our awesome friends and, you know, how to be a, you know, we have a big book coming out. Anyone who is, let's just say an adult, listen to this. We have a book coming out in uh, April, on April 4th called built to move. And it's, If you wanted to be a successful archer, I would say when this book comes out, grab a copy. It's all the things that you could do in your life to set you up for successful archery. It's not diet. It's not exercise. It's thinking differently about how you move, what you can do, how do you take care of yourself, how to all these these integrative practices so you can manage a, a complex system in a complex environment. But these are the things that make us human. And I think again, without romanticizing that idea, you have to walk in order to be a human and to load yourself. If you, you need to sleep this amount of time when, again, when we're working through complex behaviors at the highest levels of sports and performance, you know, the tour de France just finished. And I don't think people realize that the tour de France has a bus. These teams have a bus every rider has their own washing machine so they can limit the amount of allergens and disease between riders. Every rider has their own mattress and pillow and sheets in their room so they can minimize the sleep disruption and variability. So the, the, the athlete is sleeping on the same surface on the same pillow in the same situation every single night. That's the level of degree of care we're starting to realize implicates and impacts world-class performance. So well, what does that mean? Well, if you know you're going to be sleeping in a weird place, take your pillow with you. Sleep on your same pillow. You know, make sure that that room is dark the night before you sleep, that you start to control some of these little tiny variables. And all of a sudden what we see is, as our friend says, small hinges swing big doors. And again, what I always want to see is I want to see who's the best shooter. I want to see who's the best archer. I want to see who's the best athlete, who handles the pressure the greatest, not who is able to buffer whiskey and burgers and poor competition you know what i mean like let's wipe all of that off the table and then we can really see who's the best and that is super cool that's awesome so uh i'm we've I, we're probably about at time and, and it's it's all good i like i said we may end up having to do more of this if your schedule per, uh, allows it but where where can what kind of services does the ready state offer and where can they find this information i actually well i mean i know where it's at but it's i'm looking at your website i've been looking at your website since like 11 o'clock um <laughs> but like can you just talk to like some of the stuff that you do some of the, some of the options that people who listen to the podcast you know what where they can benefit from maybe signing up for a free trial or, or listening, listening to the podcast, any, any service that you provide that would, that could potentially help someone. You know, if you want to see how I think about movement and sort of the ex- expression of that coaching, go to our Instagram. You can see, i you know, I have, I just did a five part tick series on elbow pain. Right. And I say TikTok cause I now have, a minute to discuss complex conversations and complex problems. Otherwise the algorithm doesn't recognize me anymore. Yeah. Um, but simultaneously, if you go over to our YouTube site, there's a ton there. You know, I've been making videos since 2010 about all of this stuff. Um, if you, um, if you go to our app and search for the ready state on the app store, you can go into the app and click on which body part hurts. That's a great place to start. Or, you know, Hey, I feel like I want to do something for my hamstrings tonight. You can click on the daily, you know, mobility or daily maintenance stuff. The site and the the app are great resources to begin a conversation with yourself about taking care of yourself and improving your performance. Cause those are the same things. And then, you know, we offer, we have a podcast, we have courses, we make, I mean, you know, we've been doing this for a minute and we work with choose a professional sport. We're there. We yeah, get to work. We get that. to, and we get to see behind the scenes for everyone's dirty laundry. So 
when I say I've seen these things is because everyone's solving the same sets of problems. And whether you're an elite, you know, football player, whether you're, you're playing a premier soccer, it, the really the same sets of problems persist, especially if we're not, you know, 21 year old, you know, teenage millionaires, you know, who have, who have these bodies who can just do it over and over again. I come to my practices with a history of trauma and abuse and, and I still want to perform at a high level. So how do I do that? It's so, it's so funny that you say that. Cause I, like, I have this philosophy, um, about we have we have what's called the national training system. The the system has worked for for many people. Um, that's that's taught by the head Olympic coach stuff like that. And it's a good system. It's a ground. It's a it's it's groundwork for a teaching platform to teach people how to shoot archery. Right. It's geared strictly toward Olympic recurve, nothing else. But they try to apply it to trad and 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 barebow and stuff like that. But I always say it. I was shooting that system when I when the back issue started. Um, I know issues ever prior to that. And I'm not blaming it on that system. But what I am saying is that I think that that system works great for teenagers and 20 somethings who legitimately have minimal issues with their body, mobility issues, low back issues, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think it works great for those people. But I think when you take a 30 or a 40 year old person that wants to start archery and you trying to contort their body into these positions, but they have these underlying ailments they don't even know about because they can't get into a deep um, squat without falling over. They can't, they can't do a squat without valgus with their, I think it's valgus knees when their knees come in and come out. They can't do those things. They have all of these, these mobility and tight muscle issues and then they're trying to contort their bodies and do all this stuff. And then they're like, well, why doesn't this work? Why am I in pain? Why? Are, and, and you try to say to people like Olympic athletes training in this, in this way to shoot archery, have access to team doctors, massage therapists, gyms, mobility equipment, everything possible that they need, they have access to, or some resource for, but you Joe blow or Susie, whoever that shooting archery, picking it up, that's shooting in their backyard, learning off of YouTube, trying to do this system, but they don't, they, they have these issues that really prevents them from honestly doing it correctly. And they're not, they're, they're trying to learn one thing, but not address the underlying issue. And then what does that do that compounds a new issue? And that could be target panic. It could just be shooting in pain. It could be whatever. And it makes for an unenjoyable experience. And then what does that end up in? That, uh, that, that, that's less retention for the sport. That's right. People give up. They walk away. They quit doing it. They get frustrated. And it's a lot of times it's a lack of knowledge to address the issues that are actually at hand. And they don't get to shoot archery the rest of their lives. Or well, imagine if I handed you a 40 pound weight and I was like, we're going to do 100 reps with this 40 pound weight. You'd be like, whoa, bro, that's a lot. And I'm yeah. like, is it? Like, because yeah. that's yeah. how we measure volume in the weight room, right? We're through yeah. poundage. Yeah. you know and i'm like you just put out eight thousand pounds today of, of work like that's yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of poundage on there so yeah. you know you suddenly your periodization model i'm like of course it makes perfect sense look at just look at the loading through the system so i paddled a canoe on the u.s canoe and kayak team okay in a different life a long time ago so okay. i paddled canoe one-sided rotational sport does that sound familiar to anyone on this podcast oh, yeah, and right. uh and and paddled myself right off the team with a severe neck injury where my hand went weak and i had this problem i was like 23 24 and uh you know when i asked everyone what was going on they were like oh yeah it always happens and i was like you knew this was gonna happen you know and that was really the thing that sent me down the path i did one thing unilaterally forever you know, and you did not work us. We did, you know, 11 to 13 workouts a week, you know, how many thousands of strokes pulling on one side in a twisted position. And that's the same unilateral pattern we're seeing, whether I'm swinging a bat, swinging a tennis racket or shooting a, an arrow. So we know what to do. We just have to do the right things. And more important, we have to think, well, when, when are you going to be able to do this in your life? And that's why our, Juliet and I, my wife and I, my, who, my wife is also a three-time world champion paddler. Um, she, uh, and I are, we have two daughters, we have businesses, we don't live like monks, we don't have a food prep business, we're actual people working. And so we put that through the filter of, hey, 
the archery, the bow is how you express yourself. It's your community and identity. And if you can't hurt because your shoulder hurts, you've cut yourself off from your, your tribe, from your community. So yeah. let's make sure that we're at least figuring out ways to be able to kind of continue to do this our whole lives. Yeah, that's, a, that's such a great point. That, and that's a, I, something I never even remotely thought of um, as far as it's your community. And when you can't do it, you lose access to that community or Ooh. at least, you know, and that's, that's just not a good place to be. And in today's world, ugh, COVID, the post COVID, the, you know, like we went through that for two years and, and to be able to, you know, or to, to not be able to be supported by your community, all because an injury prevents you from doing a thing, um, you know, or frustration or something like that. Like, yeah, ah, that's a huge, that's a huge message. If, if you people that are out there that listen to this, that's one thing. If you do, if you're not shooting archer anymore for a reason, address it get back to your community. That's a, it's a great lesson to be learned right there. Might be a great way to end it, to be honest with you for today. And um, yeah, man, if you're shooting more archery, so quick, quick story before we close this thing out, Kelly shoots archery. I had no idea he shot archery before um, I sent the message to the ready state. Like, Hey, I'd, you know, really like to, to do this collaboration and have a podcast and then it was like, oh yeah, I got a longbow, shoot a little, I got a bear recurve, shoot a little compound. I'm like, no idea that you even had any archery experience whatsoever. And I mean, I guess at best, to to be fair, you're a recreational shooter. Are you a hunter or no? No. I, I, oh, are you kidding? I'm not good enough to be a hunter. That's yeah. what I'd say. Then that's fine. That's a, that's a good reason not to hunt. You know, no, it's not a good reason not. I'm to sure. Hunt. I'm sure I could hit an animal, but I could never kill an animal. Yeah. Yeah. And but but you still shoot and you're i do know that you're involved with or have i'm sure in some ways involved with some high level athletes that do shoot and like i know like chris spieler um dan stanton um and obviously rich froney he's he's a hunter but some of those the the bigger names throughout the years of crossfit i know a lot of them naturally found a progression to go into shooting like a compound and becoming somewhat um skilled at it and and it's no, it's no surprise that those people gravitate towards such a, such a sport and then excel at it because they're already physically taking care of themselves at a high level. And, you know, that's one, that's one location or one idea in archery that people don't do a good enough job of taking care of themselves outside of archery. And I think we, that's it's, I love again, show. we, it's an incredible opportunity. We all come from somewhere. And our traditional past may have been that, well, if you're working on a farm all day long, you're pretty durable. So maybe you don't need, and you're sitting on the ground, you're camping, you're hiking a lot. That's not the environment. So some of our, some of our behaviors have changed as we have evolved into more sort of desk bound athletes. That's okay. But now we're just saying, Hey, here's what we know is best practice or better practices you know, start, start toying with it and see how you feel. And really the proof is always in the pudding that, that, you know, you will feel better. And that's the reason to do it. It's always about performance and it's about longer performance. It's not about fear-based archery, you know? Yeah. Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, I, um, I think it's, I think it's a great way to go out. Where can everybody follow you at Kelly? We are the ready state. And then I want to shout out to, to my big hunter friends, Brad and, and Greg, and uh, if you're listening. I appreciate you guys. Cause they've all gone from, you know, long guns to bows. Cause it, they found it to be a lot more sporting. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think you find that a lot. It happens a lot. People get uh, 400 yard shots with a, um, with a rifle become a little less enthusiastic and they're like, okay, well, I'm going to hunt with a compound. And then the compound is like 60 yards, 70 yards. People are killing animals, 50 yards, 40 yards, 30 yards. And then it's like, well, you know what? I want to, I'm going to try to kill something with a wood bow or, or, a, an ILF recurve of some kind. I, I shot my first buck with a wood um black widow recurve last year ah so 30, sick 31 yards you know went 110 yards waited overnight found it the next day um you know it's an accomplishment no sights no aids just a piece of wood a string and an arrow and you know it's there's 
there's a level of preparation that goes into hunting. There's a level of preparation that goes into everything. We should, in my opinion, be putting that level of preparation into our bodies as well. Um, and that's where the ready state sort of comes into play. So such a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Yeah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to kill the live stream. So hang out for a second, everybody who watched on Facebook live and the Barebow project subscriber group. Thank you very much. Um, this will only be up for a little while. Uh, I'll probably get rid of it and do the edited version. You'll have to follow it up on YouTube. Um, but everyone else, make sure you check out the ready state and Dr. Kelly Starrett. Live stream is done.